My name is Kevin Danaher. Um, I'm on the faculty at Feather River College up in Quincy, California, which is the county seat of Plumas County. And my presentation is about a project we're working on up there. I'm teaching a class this fall on how to revive a vacant school property that's sitting right in the middle of town on Main Street that's been vacant for the past few years. The school district doesn't know what to do with it. So we're putting together a, a class to develop a proposal and I'm going to show you slides about, you know, what, what's, what's the status of the plan so far. So the, the prime directive is from William McDonough, how do we love all the children of all species for all time. The Maidu economy was the economy, the Maidu native people. Plumas County is this piece right in here, right, the mountain Maidu. And it was a regenerative economy under local control. They weren't dependent on outside inputs. The white man came along and replaced it with an extractive economic model. Gold, extractive. Timber, extractive. They're still taking trees out every day. The lumber trucks go through our town. Water, extractive. The Feather River reaches 20 million Californians. It's the headwaters of the California water system first reservoir antelope lake is in our county. Hydroelectric, PG&E has all these dams. Do we get any money from the electricity that the customers pay for the electricity? No, it doesn't return to us. The extractive economic model makes outsiders wealthy and leaves behind environmental damage and poverty. Despite the natural wealth of the Feather River watershed, which is basically Plumas County, we have serious poverty. Poverty, we rank number one among California counties for percentage of population dying from opioid oh overdose. Oh, yeah. So why are third, so-called third world countries poor even though they have vast natural resources, the gold of South Africa, the copper of Colombia? The extractive economic model was imposed by the colonial masters. So now Plumas County is transitioning to a new economy based on second homes, tourism, recreation, which means keep the trees standing, don't cut them all down. The Feather River watershed is larger than Yosemite and Yellowstone. More nesting bird species, more mammal species, more reptile species, more amphibian species, way more plant species than these two famous sites, yet we have all this poverty. So here's the original school built in 1905, still standing, it's rock solid but it needs a lot of rehab. It needs about $4 million worth of rehab. So we're teaching this class in the fall starting Tuesday for 10 weeks, every Tuesday night. And the idea is to transform it into a resilience innovation center. Resilience is the new term in a lot of funding community like Rockefeller Foundation. And they're funding 100 cities so far. Rockefeller wants to do 10,000 cities to hire chief resilience officers but it's all cities, and that's great. Cities need to do sustainability, but what about a rural model? Because we've got a lot of rural school districts with empty property. So it's a community building model providing affordable space for collaboration among the three groups, nonprofits, companies, and government agencies. You bring those three sectors together, you can change things. Educate the public, create good jobs, and bring together, there's a lot of green companies and artisans they can't afford a good retail location on Main Street. This thing is right on Main Street in town. So the idea is merge green technology with homesteading skills and permaculture techniques. It's right on Main Street. There's three schools that are walkable, including a Christian school. Remember, Jesus only got violent one time, and it was bankers. The so money changes in the temple because they were defiling God's house. Who runs the world? International Monetary Fund, World Bank, World Trade Organization. I've written books about these organizations. They're secret, but they run the world. And are they defiling God's creation of the planet? Oh, yeah. And so we're less violent than Jesus. He whipped them with a knotted rope and tipped their stuff over. We're not saying destroy the World Bank. We're saying turn it into a daycare center. <laughs> so it's a, it would be a community center, an education center, prepare for future careers, skills training. There's a lot of people who have homesteading skills in Plumas County. They know how to make soap from goat milk and, you know, how to, how to do, uh, make stuff out of wood, build for rustic furniture, all that kind of stuff. Develop a 500-year plan and be the first county in America with a 500-year plan. 
why shouldn't we have a 500-year plan? Because when all the ice on the planet melts, it raises ocean levels over 200 feet. Central Valley of California fills in with water. People are going to move uphill. We're at 3,400 feet. So we're safe. Lots of events. These events go on anyway, but this would be a central location to have those events. And I'll say more later about Eco Gym and Eco Playground, where everything that moves, the kinetic energy is transformed into electricity. Green jobs in the U.S. grew more than twice as fast as the general job market between 98 and 2008 when the economy crashed, thank you, banking sector, uh, the money changers, and had fewer setbacks. Environmental consulting firms saw revenue reach $11.7 billion by 2016. And there are a lot of nature-based jobs. We know about nature deficit disorder. There's already gardening programs at the existing schools in Plumas County. So there's a, a base, an institutional base to build on. There's a bunch of uh, colleges. I teach at Feather River College. Feather River College is a community college. We have AA degrees. But there's one bachelor's degree that's offered by the college, and it's equine and ranch management. It's a horse college. OK, great. Permaculture fits right into ranch management. The college just acquired 180 acres adjoining the campus that's stream bottomland and forest hillside. So a lot of potential for permaculture training. Uh, the vacant building has huge potential for solar on the roof, way too much asphalt. Whose fault? Asphalt. Uh, a lot of storage in the basement. It's a, it's a great building, but it's not being used. Uh, the roof, the tall trees, parking lot, potential for wind energy. That vertical wind energy is in Golden Gate Park. We're at the top of the Feather River Canyon. Every day, the Central Valley heats up. That hot air comes up the Feather River Canyon, and it hits our town. The property that I own is an 18-acre forest, and my western side is a, almost like a straight slope. And every afternoon, about 1 or 2 in the afternoon, the wind hits that, and I've got all these little fans set up, and they're spinning like crazy. So we have wind, wind energy potential. In 2015, 90% of all new US energy systems were renewable energy, and half of that was wind power. Wind power is the fastest growing energy on the planet. U.S. Department of Energy funds wind for schools focused on rural schools. And we are very rural. Plumas County has only 18,000 residents. It's the entire Feather River watershed that's only got 18,000 residents. 70% of the county is national park, right? So. We're, you know, we the people own the majority of it. The fastest growing job category in America is wind energy technician. Uh, there's workforce housing on site. This could be where I'm thinking two staff initially, one for programming, teaching kids, all that kind of stuff, and the other a physical maintenance person to take care of the grounds because it is a big property. Um, there's a play area that could be an animal pen or, you know, all sorts of the eco playground could be in that area. It's fenced off and safe. It's a super safe town. We leave our keys in our car at night. We don't lock our doors. It's awesome. The, the crime is like a guy got drunk and ran off the road. Um, massive lawn. And this, like, if you were taking this photo, you'd be standing on Main Street. And it's just huge property. That was my 14-year-old, by the way. Awesome kid, super creative, with some vegetables from the backyard. And way too much asphalt, so we could do all sorts of raised beds on the asphalt. A performance stage, right? There used to be events like this on that space. And it's an opportunity to teach people about the importance of music in our culture. I did a lot of work in South Africa. The whole political movement for liberation in South Africa was so infused with music. Meetings like this, everything would get interrupted by music on a regular basis. So sustainable building design, energy efficient, on-site energy generation, water collection and reuse, green building materials, workforce housing where people walk 50 feet to work. It's the greenest commute in the world. Community art, there's a lot of potential for that. We've got a lot of artists in our, and, and Ken here can tell you after this, you can talk to him about the artist community up there. 
neighborhood park and an eco mall where these small producers and artisans who are producing good products but can't afford to have a retail location on Main Street, you bring them all together and they share space. California Plumbing Code has opportunities for reducing water use, using gray water systems, water recycling, rainwater catchment. We get a lot of rain up there because we're in the mountains, we're at 3,400 feet. There's a stream running through the property that's not being used for a generation or education or anything right now. There are little flipper kind of devices that you could put in a stream. Water is 250 times as dense as wind. So to move some kind of a, a device, it's actually the first electricity for this town was generated by a stream, Ganser Creek. Ecolab, a green innovation workshop where you incubate entrepreneurs who occasionally need professional conference space, right? And you bring them together and they start sharing ideas. We've seen this here with various uh, shared workplaces in the Bay Area. Eco gym, everything, stationary bicycles, rowing machines, arm cranks, generate electricity, and educate the users at Mission High School in San Francisco when I worked for the city government and the Department of Environment, and I had some money. We got a bike, a stationary bike, that generated electricity, and we had an incandescent bulb, a compact fluorescent, and an LED. And they could see, oh, the LED is really easy. Oh, the compact fluorescent is a little hard. Oh, the incandescent is really hard. So you get a somatic understanding of energy efficiency, right? You feel it in your muscles. Uh, exercise can power events. A 20-person spin class can generate two kilowatt hours. And people can either use their own bikes or there are these rollers that you put your back wheel into and it spins it. And Rock the Bike here in the Bay Area, John, who runs is an old buddy of mine, he's a crazy guy. And they create these bike blenders. It's like the most popular uh, pedal power. And they power events, yeah. Are these bikes actually connected to generators and yeah. producing energy in your... They will be. Well. This is all ideas at this point, right? right? Playground equipment, this stuff all exists, right, where you're capturing the electricity that's generated <laughs> by the movement, right? And, and it, that, that generates a possibility for patenting of things, too, right? And then that's revenue for the project. Uh, other sustainability features, natural products, new leaf paper, recycled paper, recycling, composting. There's not a composting system in this town. It's a rural community that doesn't do, I mean, that there's composting that happens, but it's not on an organized county-wide basis. And, and dumb. And upcycling. Upcycling, uh, there's a really good book by William McDonough, the green architect, called Upcycling, where the basic principle is everything we produce, when we're done using, it has to either go back into the industrial process as raw material or into the earth as compost. Um, this has been proven in Portland and other places that they take over intersections and paint them. It slows down traffic, it brings people out, it builds community, it creates a different kind of culture. There's a really good book by Charles Montgomery called Happy City. I really highly recommend you read Happy City. He brings together city planning, urban architecture, and brain science, and he shows if you have trees on your sidewalk, neighbors will know each other better. There'll be less crime. He makes the connection between the physical environment and what goes on in human culture. So what's the financial model? The school district retains ownership of the property. They lease it to our nonprofit. Let's call it Resilience Innovation Center, the RIC. Let's go to the RIC. Did you get RIC last night? Yeah, I was Ricky, baby. Because it's a youth focus, right? Youth enterprise focus. Um, that, that cheap rent on a massive property allows us to then give affordable rents to the organizations that are going to use it, that are going to rent space, etc. Diverse funding goes to building upgrade and personnel. We'll do a capital campaign that needs about $4 million to fix it up. Certificates of participation are a bond that gets issued into the bond market at about 4%, and it's paid with rent revenue. There's a group called uh, Thompson Dorfman. They're developers here in the Bay Area. 
they do luxury housing to make their money, and they have a nonprofit arm that works with at least four cases I know of school districts that have unused property. And they say, look, we'll build teacher housing on the school site so the teachers can just walk a few blocks or so to work and be able to afford it, right? And they've done this in at least four school districts that I know of. So it's a working model. And the certificates of participation get paid with the rent revenue, and rent is cheap. New market tax credits is federal money for promoting business in low income areas. Rockefeller Foundation is doing all these uh, resilience grants. California trap and cap and trade money. It's billions of dollars for climate remediation. If we're teaching young people how to plant trees and grow gardens and all that kind of stuff, if they won't fund that, we'll, we'll protest outside. But by the way, you see my shirt, Green Guardians. We were getting ready, got the t-shirts. So the Green Guardians, imagine 50 kids outside some fat cat's office going, hey, where's the money for our program? I think they, they consider it. So operations, third party property manager. You don't want the school district being the landlord, right? So the nonprofit will be the manager of the property. First priority for residential space goes to on-site employees. School district owns the land and all of the improvements and the promotional value. I'm not a politician. I don't want to run for office. A lot of school board people are looking to then move on to be county supervisor or run for state government, whatever. I'm not into that, and I don't care who gets, you know, Harry Truman said, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. I think a good executive producer does it, does it that way. So this is the Green Guardians model. We already have a nice logo. It was designed for San Francisco, but who knows, you know, so what? We can adjust it. We had a program, I ran a program in San Francisco in seven high schools where we got the kids out doing environmental service learning, planting gardens, planting trees. Mission High School, we took out an asphalt parking lot and put a farm on the campus. And one block away was Byright Market. Sam McGonham, the owner, was on this, the advisory council of the school, and I was on the advisory council. He agreed to buy everything the kids would produce before we took, I said to the kids, you can't screw this up. You've got to market for your products before you start it. It's a market economy. If you know there's a market for your product before you even start, you, it's really hard to screw it up. And um, uh, so a bunch of different ideas for fundraising, right? Enterprise fundraising, because at Global Exchange, we always did stores and tours and book publishing and events like the Green Festival, stuff that would generate its own revenue so we don't have to do much begging, right? So this is a proven model, brick making. We got tons of clay in Plumas County. My property is just loaded with clay, and there are these you know, manual compressors. You take uh, little metal letters, and you put the family name, the Smith family, whatever, you know, it's 50 bucks and it costs you two bucks to produce it. It's a great way to raise money. This huge property could be a teaching farm, right? And we teach the teachers. The more teachers that we teach about agriculture and soil science, the better off we'll be for them teaching the kids. Right across the street from the property is the main food co-op. Awesome, it's a co-op, member owned. There's Two thousand members, really, it's all organic, etc. So it's right at the property, the school property is right across the street. So they can pre-purchase whatever crops, garlic, onions, potatoes that they tell us to grow. We teach the kids how to grow it. We use the pre-purchase money, they also do grants for local projects, to buy the raised beds and the tools and the seeds and all that kind of stuff, the irrigation. Um, we can grow and sell plants that remove toxins. This is NASA research. There's all sorts of, you know, indoor air is more polluted than outdoor air. So if you've got a youth group, Green Guardians, that's growing these plants, and we go to Facebook and Twitter and Google and these other tech companies and say, hey, we're selling plants for your office that'll detox the air for your workers, and your workers will be healthier. Or do you want a bunch of youth outside your office protesting with signs and, and pissing on your name in the media? I think they might go for it. It's a little tough cop, nice cop enterprise model, right? So seed ball vending, a woman in LA whose father was a gumball uh, distributor, she did this, right? It's educational. 
you toss them around. At the green festivals, we used to sell these with a slingshot. So you could shoot them over the walls and fences and stuff like that. Plenty of opportunity for wood, uh, rustic furniture, right? A lot of city people will pay a lot of money for wood. You know, it's value added. We've got forests up the wazoo up there. We got trees down that need to be cleared for fire uh, reduction. And you can build all sorts of stuff out of it. And we have residents in the county who know how to do this. So it's just about connecting the dots. Yeah, youth get trained in resilient skills. We need to start using this term solutionaries. We need to be solutionaries. Revolutionary, yeah, I'm a revolutionary, but you know, some people react negatively to that. Solutionary, it's totally positive, right? We're gonna fix this stuff. And it, and it goes right up against a new term, mark this term, I just created it, apocalyptic cynicism. Yeah. <laughs> apocalyptic cynicism. Oh, the Earth's being destroyed, we're all going to die. No, we're not all going to die. The ones who survive are the ones who adapt. That's what evolution science teaches us, whoever adapts best. And there's models out there already. I've sat on furniture made from cardboard, and it's amazing. It can actually hold you up, you know. All sorts of possibilities. So we have to think multi-generationally. We have to be good ancestors. We think of ancestors as the people who came before us, but we are ancestors. The masons who laid the foundation of the cathedrals in Europe that took 400 years to build, they knew they wouldn't see the final product of their work. But they knew they had to do very solid, precise work because of all the weight that was going to come on top of their work. And that's us. We're laying the basis for a future global economy with no starving children, no clear-cut forests, no wars for oil. And it's going to come about, it's just how long is it going to take and how much death and destruction happens en route, right? So the idea is to create a new model of community development and then spread it, make it open source to other communities. Because all across this country, there's vacant school properties that they don't know what to do with. The board of supervisors in the school district, they're not entrepreneurs, they're not activists, they're not radicals. So we come in and say, we've got a way to revitalize your property and you will take the political credit for it. If it fails, I'll take the blame. If it succeeds, you get all the credit and I'll dissolve it to the background and go somewhere else. No, that is actually in Qatar. <laughs> <laughs> which doesn't have a lot of water resources. They're using desalinated water, but, but it makes it a tourist attraction. Actually, that park has all sorts of waterfall, you know, flower, everything out of flowers. It's, it's pretty amazing. So the idea is to create a new model of community development that's not corporate dominated. And again, the prime directive that I will leave you with is how do we love all the children of all species for all time. Remember in Star Trek, they had, the prime directive was don't interfere. You're going to go to these other planets and see these other beings. Don't interfere. It was an anti-imperialist, anti-colonial kind of directive. Well, if our prime directive was how do we love all the children of all species for all time, we'd fix all this stuff because policy coming down from this prime directive would have to be you know, biophilic and nature-based and sensitive and loving and compassionate and caring, etc. So, that's my presentation. I hope I didn't go too fast. <laughs> Questions, comments, criticism? Let me, let me go on Facebook Live. Can you see me? <laughs> Hi, guys. Are people watching? Oh, cool. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, Feather River College, which I'm on the faculty, the school district, when I, first, when I first came to this town, I see the college and the school district, and there's a little bit of communication and connection, but not, it's like, wait a minute, you got two educational institutions, this is for the younger ones, and then here's this awesome college right there, my property is actually right across the road from the college. And it's really a great college. It's small, it's about 1,500 students, but it's massive property. We got all these horses and free horse manure 
and the composting potential is huge, and a great library, and great faculty, so the potential is massive, and it's more about, well, it's like soil science, right? Connecting, connecting, making the connections. Yeah. I guess I was thinking about, um, are there other individuals in the community that are, have become part of this? Yeah, there's a land preservation group, the guild. Yeah, uh, working with me. Plumas <laughs> County. If, yeah. if you look up Plumas Growers, Dot com or dot org. Plumas Growers is the cannabis growers. We formed a 501c6 trade association and we wrote the first draft of the county ordinance. Most of the northeast counties have continued prohibition on cannabis production, which is really stupid. It's a magic plant. There's 113 cannabinoids. All mammals are born with cannabinoid receptors. In your cerebellum, the all the different parts of your brain, except for the brain stem, which controls your breathing and your heart, which is why you can't overdose on marijuana. You know, there's more deaths from peanuts each year than from cannabis, but it's illegal and cigarettes are legal. Kids can get cannabis easier than cigarettes because cigarettes are regulated. So we're saying, let's regulate this crop. It's an amazing, it's a magical crop. So hopefully, you know, that's going to continue and progress and generate income because a lot of these younger cannabis growers they know how to make medicinals and edibles and all these other products that use the terpenes and the cannabinoids because everybody knows THC was the psychoactive ingredient but there's all these other ingredients that are not psychoactive so those kinds of institutions already exist and it's more about creative platform I started the Green Festivals back in 2002, and it was about create an event like this where all these people can come together and meet each other and get to know each other, and they'll work it out. They, you know, the bicycle makers and the bicycle activists get together and they go, "Hey, wait, we can work together." You don't need to do step aside. Yeah. You are the founder of the Green Festival that started in San Francisco. <laughs> and Global Exchange and yeah. Fair Trade USA, the Fair Trade Certifying Agency, and now the Green Guardian. Are you going to do a Green Festival this year? Green Festival's dead. Oh. We sold it. Oh. No. It's sorry to tell you. We sold it a few years ago, and there was a transition overlap where we cooperated in the transition, the two nonprofits, Green America and Global Exchange. But we just couldn't handle it anymore. It was, it was too big, and there was too much. The problem with it is these big venues are really expensive, but you can't charge a lot of admission, and you can't charge your vendors very much. So you have limited revenue, but high expenses. And these big buildings, you got to take their security people, their union contract, their Teamster contract. I could write a book about the pain in the ass hemorrhoids involved in big event production. But my intent in creating the Green Festivals was not to do an event. It was to create a real estate model, Eco Mall, where these small green companies could share a really great location. Because on their own, they can't. In Quincy, on our main street, there's empty storefront, empty storefront, empty storefront, because Amazon and Walmart are just wrecking the small business sector. So if the idea is create a platform where all of these different small companies can come together and share space and share contacts and technology and... Uh, Could you elaborate a little bit? What's going on with the new Green Festival? Because we were invited last year. It's done. They, were almost they, a they pulled the plug. Quarter. We so went out. One quarter of the vendors, and they said they were being charged so much, and half of the ones I talked to said they're not going to come back. So what's going on? It's done. It's done. They pulled the plug. The German company that we saw, we went out and we looked at different companies to sell it to. We found a German company that was owned by the city of Stuttgart and the regional government, we, and they were very progressive and green. And they just made some mistakes and were losing money, and they pulled the plug on it. It's over. You see the plug. I don't understand that because Green Festival has announced it's happening again in San Francisco. When did you get that announcement? Um, about a month ago. Yeah. Well. Since then, has it changed? I got an email, very terse email, saying it's over. It's done. So sorry to be the conveyor of bad news, but.
And not everything, you know, trees die, plants die, humans die, not everything is meant to go forever. And we learned from it, and we, we were in eight cities and affected millions of people. Yeah, so. So, but, you know, we can do another one. Yes, ma'am. I like the idea of teaching a class to start to develop something like this. Can you tell how you're going to do that? Uh, we're going to meet, actually, now that I know about Facebook Live, I'll do Facebook Live on each of our meetings. We meet on Tuesday evenings from 6 to 8 in the headquarters of the school district. They're providing room space, nice big screen, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the tuition is 50 bucks. So, you know, it's not prohibitive in terms of who can participate. And I'm trying to recruit, you know, teachers and carpenters and roofers and, you know, whoever, you know, could possibly contribute because volunteer labor, it's got an asbestos roof. Okay, so you want to do historic preservation. Well, is there anybody still doing asbestos roofs? <laughs> I don't know. So. You know, those kinds of things, the fundraising, the youth programming, there's people in existence who know how to do this. I know how to do some of it. I used to be on a foundation board, and there's a, a group called the uh, F uh, Funders Network for Smart Growth and Livable Communities. They couldn't think of a longer name. And it's over a hundred foundations from Ford, Annie, Casey, Big, Rockefeller, et cetera, down to the little local family foundations. And what I noticed over the years of participating in that network, they do a thing where when there's a good project, they'll get several foundations to put up a little bit of money. If it succeeds, each one can take credit for it, but they're not risking a lot, right? It's like, you know, a spare change for them to put up $50,000. You put a few of those, so in, the, in March, I'm giving a presentation to their annual meeting and say, come on, you know, if you each kick in ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, we can get this thing rolling up to the next stage where we can hire personnel, get the programs going, generate revenue, et cetera. So it's a business model. Um, as he informed you, I am a fellow resident of Plumas County. I can affirm that everything he is telling you is accurate. You know, he is a wonderful person to have in. We are working together on many things. And what I see you doing is creating a model for, well, I'm doing the presentation after him, which we should have combined them together because we're in the process of creating the transportation infrastructure that will help build the community that he's envisioning, which I think will extend way beyond rural and the urban areas. Yeah. So His presentation is going to be about a, a trail network, a non-motorized trail network yeah. California-wide. We've already got the Pacific Crest Trail, so you know that's a great start. And then all these others. And Plumas County, it's a gem. By the way, if any of you are interested in investing in real estate, I have a list of properties <laughs> that are raw land kind of properties. 10 acres in Butterfly Valley with a spring and a stream. Because if you got water, because what's going to happen is the counties all around us are prohibiting cannabis. We're going to have legal canna commercial cannabis production, which means there's going to be a bunch of money coming in. And that property that's for sale now at really cheap prices it's going to go up in value for sure. It's one of the reasons why I jumped on an 18-acre forest right by the college, that when I'm up in my forest, I'm just like, I grew up in an 18-acre pine forest in New Jersey, and this is an 18-acre pine forest. And it was just like, oh my god, I'm home. <laughs> pine needles. My mom was always like, you got pine needles in your clothes. Yeah, well, I was out in the trees, you know. We always had tree forts all over. So the idea is a long-term plan is an eco-village with earth-sheltered homes, because it's a sloped property. I'm already digging my hole, and my big brown rectangular hole. Um, that's a song title, I think. And, uh, and tree houses, right? You know, tree house masters, there's a lot of great technology now around tree houses. And what rents out faster, fastest of all homes on Airbnb? Tree houses. So. Not that I'm a big Airbnb fan. <laughs> Anything else? We have only a few minutes left. So if anybody, you got my, I don't know I if I put, my email, 
My yeah. email is Kevin at globalexchange.org. Kevin at globalexchange.org. And if you're interested in the, the pro rural properties, I have a whole list and it's digitized. So you, there's photos and information and stuff. And the real estate broker that I deal with is a really cool guy. He grew up there, good old boy, Randy Bardo. And he, he knows the scene. He's the guy that helped me get my property at a really good, good financial structure, all that kind of stuff. So, and we need more progressive people. The 52% of the county voted Trump, but there's a big Bernie contingent, a lot of activists, especially since the last election. And, uh, you know, there's a saying among the Sutu people in South Africa that translates, dying bull kicks the hardest. The fossil fuel industry is going down and they're desperate. So they'll back somebody like Trump, an idiot who's not prepared for that kind of job. You know, where else do you hire somebody totally unprepared for a position? It's ridiculous, right? And he's showing the chaos. So we need to see this at, yeah, it's dangerous, but there's a positive side to it. This is the end of the fossil fuel era. And they're gonna fight like hell, but they're doomed. They're doomed. And the marketplace is what's killing them. I mean, wind energy and solar energy are just beating them in the marketplace. So it's, it's going to be good. What is, what is the age range of the town or the county? There's a lot of, it's, it's largely white, but it's interesting because our college, because it's got a big sports focus, brings in a lot of African-American guys from Miami and other places. And then when the snow comes at 3,400 feet, they're like, what the? You know, deer on campus, do they bite? You know, <laughs> so it's, it's cute in terms of biodiversity, you know, and culture clash. A um, lot of old, older white people, a lot of aging white people, a lot of a really high density of social service agency stuff much higher than cities on a per capita basis, right? Which makes it tough because the state and federal government will go, wait a minute, you already have way more density of service per population. We only have 18,000 people in the whole county and it's massive county, right? So it's got its own unique challenges. Yes, ma'am. No, I, oh. I just waiting for you because I want to see the game. Oh, okay. Great. So, <laughs> thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks.